Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Lipkin, the NC Pingree Director of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to the presentation, The View from the Isle of France, Elias Haskett Derby Jr.'s East Indies Voyage with the 2021 Francis E. Malamy Research Fellow at the Phillips Library, Hisu Cho. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with us. Closed captioning for tonight's program is available by selecting that option on your Zoom toolbar. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the Peabody Essex Museum and the Phillips Library are on the ancestral territory of the Agawam, Pawtucket, Namkeag, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag. Many other indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations. And indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. Please join us in honoring their communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you. I'll take this opportunity to offer our very special thanks to Michael Malamy and his children, Jocelyn and Adam, who funded this annual fellowship in 2007 as a lasting tribute to Francis. Francis had deep roots within the library. Uh, a longstanding member of the museum family, she dedicated tireless hours processing manuscripts in our collection. She was an extraordinary individual who believed that the Phillips Library provides value to the ac academic community and the public, and realized the importance of the collection and its potential impact on the greater intellectual world. Now, today is particularly meaningful because January 12 was Francis's birthday. We didn't know this when we settled on a date, but we're really pleased to honor her memory in, in this way. Many, many thanks are due to our PEM colleagues for putting this together and, and helping make it happen, especially Bethany Beatrice Gravel, Corey Dodge, and our creative services, guest experience, and marketing teams. And of course, he Sue for sharing her research and her knowledge with us. So a bit of housekeeping, everyone's muted, cameras are off, uh, but we do encourage questions. So feel free to submit them in the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can in uh, the final portion of the program. And a recording of tonight's presentation will be posted on PEM's YouTube channel, and we'll share that link with you when it goes live. And at this point, I'd like to welcome to the screen Jennifer Hornsby, Phillips Library's Reference and Access Services Librarian to introduce Hisu and start the program. I'm very grateful for Jen's hard work managing our fellowship programs and for her outstanding supervision and guidance of our reference services. Jen? Thanks, Dan. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to Michael Malamy and his family for the support of this fellowship. The fellowship program is exciting for the library as we get to read many great proposals, learn about new topics, and provide insight into new ways our collections can be interpreted. Um, for listeners that are interested, the Phillips Library administers the Francis E. Malamy Fellowship on an annual basis. We usually issue a call for applications in late summer and um, have a deadline of around November 1st. Uh, you should follow our social media accounts on Twitter and Instagram for announcements. Hisu Cho is a PhD candidate in history at Washington University in St. Louis. She studies um, early America and the United States with a special interest in global con commerce, maritime expansion, foreign policy, and spatial imagination. Originally from South Korea, she earned a BA from Yonsei University and an MA from Seoul National University. She's currently working on her dissertation titled um, The Making of the Mental and Material Map of the Pacific Ocean in Early America, 1740 to 1819. In her free time, she is the organizer of Early Americanists in St. Louis, a reading group made up of graduate students. And outside of her academic interests, uh, Hisu likes playing video games and watching sports. She is a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals, Manchester United, and the NC Dinos, which is a South Korean professional baseball team. And if you haven't ever had the chance to see a Korean baseball game in person, I strongly recommend getting over there. The games include cheerleaders, fun mascots, and very engaged fans. And with that endorsement, I will turn it over to Hisu. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the lovely introduction. Um, especially shout out for my um, um, baseball team back in Korea. Um, happy New Year, everyone. Um, hope you can all see me well. Um, thank you for tuning into my talk today. I'm coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. We had some beautiful weather today. Um, wherever you are, I hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy. Before I start my talk today, I wanna to thank the staff members of the Phillips Library, Jennifer, Catherine, Amanda, Dan, for supporting my work on-site during my fellowship last year. They continue to support my work online by digitizing materials. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank the Malami family who have provided this fellowship that I had the honor of being awarded in 2021. Generosity like theirs allows scholars to visit archives, libraries, and produce good and serious scholarship. So again, thank you so much for supporting my work and that of others. Now I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Um, okay, yes. So, okay, hope. You can see it. Um, the project that I'll be sharing with you today is titled The View from the Isle of France, Elia Heskett Derby Jr.'s East Indies Voyage, 1788 to 1790. This project is part of my dissertation and a work very much in progress. So I really look forward to hearing from, your, from you in the Q&A section, your thoughts, comments, and questions. They're all welcomed and really will help me improve my work. Also, there'll be several images and maps in today's presentation. I won't necessarily explain them, um, but they're really there to help you ground the story in time and specifically um, in space. So, okay, let's start. The logbook of the second Grand Turk that sailed from Salem to Calcutta in 1792 is filled with data and facts. Two months into the voyage on May 31st, sailors sighted the Tristan Island located in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean and left a rough sketch of it, as you can see here on the lower left. The logbook was a daily record of the ship's course, speed, wind, and as a seaman's journal, contained events that sailors considered noteworthy. Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe, found logbooks to be simply boring. He wrote that, the, that they were tedious accounts of their long work and had little or nothing of story in them. If logbooks did not have the same entertaining quality for the general public, expected usually of travel narratives and fictions, Defoe's genre, they contained a wealth of information for sailors and navigators. It was no coincidence that Salem's East India Marine Society established in 1799 and the precursor to the Peabody Essex Museum asked their members, sea captains and supercargoes to present their logs of their voyages upon their return. Log books were important tools of navigation as sailors used them to document and identify their location at sea. Most importantly, logbooks illustrated and captured the human labor required for sailing months and at times for years at sea. Ships didn't sail, humans did. But we often forget these human stories or push them aside when we simply say that the Grand Turk left Salem in March, 1792 and arrived at Calcutta in August, 1792, as if the ship teleported from one place to another. What happened then in between? We can draw from a lot of materials other than logbooks to fill in this in-between space. Business correspondences, the material that I'll be discussing today is one option. They're consulted mainly by economic and business historians to extract information concerning trade such as the commodity in exchange, its price, profit margin, and so on. But they contain more than just information about things. 
as I'll discuss today, they also contain stories of peoples and ideas that give meaning and value to these things. Today's talk aims to understand American commerce in the East Indies in the late 18th century through the private correspondences of Elias Haskett Derby Jr. Elias Jr. was the son of Elias Haskett Derby, also known as King Derby, and one of the most successful Massachusetts merchants in the early Republic. The Derby family's fortune largely came from the East Indies trade. Today, I'll be discussing 14 lengthy letters that Elias Jr. wrote to his father during his voyage eastward of the Cape of Good Hope between 1788 and 1790. Three large questions dominated his letters. Where to go, who to do business with, and what to trade. Elias Jr.'s observation, documentation, and speculation regarding these topics reveals a fundamental question that many Americans, American traders, were seeking to answer in this period. How can an American trader conduct trade in an old space domesticated by centuries through the interaction between indigenous and European traders with the new identity as an American citizen of a newly independent state? The answer is, of course, complicated. One of the goals of today's talk is to further examine this question by focusing on how Elias Jr. writes about the spaces that constituted the East Indies, paying attention to its geographic, social, economic, and material dimensions. Before we dive into Elias Jr.'s letters, I would like to briefly explain what is at stake here. As we historians like to ask, what is the historiographical contribution of this work? I come to this project as a historian of the early Republic and the Pacific Ocean. I study early American perceptions of the Pacific, particularly how Euro-Americans imposed a sense of coherency to the Pacific in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. We are used to seeing the Pacific as located westward of the United States in part owing to a set of historical events and narratives. Among them are the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Manifest Destiny, and the Oregon Trail. The US-China trade also plays an important role in cementing this westward perspective. But of course, European vessels had for centuries sailed to Canton, present-day Guangzhou, via the Indian Ocean. The Empress of China, the first American vessel to reach Canton in 1784, also followed this old route, as well as subsequent American vessels, including the Derby ships. The places that we nowadays associate with the Pacific Ocean, Manila, Nagasaki, and Batavia, present-day Jakarta, continued to be reached by sailing eastward at the turn of the 19th century, when more vessels started to make trans-Pacific voyages westward. What we see then in both history and historiography is a conflation between and an integration of the so-called Far East and the Far West. And for me, an early Americanist studying the Pacific Ocean, it's also a question of how and when the Far West, the Far East, becomes the Far West and eventually the American West as a potential site for exploitation for the United States. Thus, to understand American activities in the Pacific Ocean, I argue that we also have to understand American activities in the Indian Ocean without confining them to the boundaries of the Pacific or the Indian Oceans as we define them nowadays, whether they be political, economic, cultural, or ecological frameworks. Elias Jr.'s account of his own experience where he doesn't use the word Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, or the East Indies for that matter, provides an alternative reading of this space shaped by human networks, the interconnection of markets, and the supply and demand of goods. Elias Jr. was an inexperienced merchant and navigator of 21 years old when he sailed for the Isle of France on the first Grand Turk in November of 1787. It was the Grand Turk's third voyage eastward 
and second voyage around the Cape of Good Hope. The Isle of France here marked with the red arrow on the lower right, present day Mauritius is located on the Southeast coast of Africa, about 500 miles east of Madagascar. It also lies in the sailing route around the Cape of Good Hope to the Indian Ocean. The island was first quote unquote discovered by the Portuguese in the early 16th century, then settled by the Dutch in the 17th century. It became a French colony in 1715 and was captured by the British in 1810. Mauritius became independent in 1968. In 1784, France permitted American vessels to trade in the island, and as a result, the Isle of France served as a gateway to the East Indies trade for American traders. The Derby family was one of the first American pioneers of this trade. Elias Jr. was sent as an agent to manage the Derby business that went through the Isle of France. And to fulfill this role, he first had to cross the Atlantic Ocean. It took the Grand Turk 110 days to reach the Isle of France from Salem. Overall, the voyage was uneventful. The Grand Turk followed the old and familiar route, stopping at Cape Verde, accidentally touching the island of Trinidad, close to the South American continent, and then going around the Cape of Good Hope. The agreeable weather that the voyage enjoyed before entering the Cape of Good Hope was not simply pure luck, but a result of calculating the season and weather. Elias Jr. knew what was going on when the ship drifted towards the island of Trinidad. The trades holding more to the southward than ordinary pressed us far down upon the southern coast of America, he wrote. What Elias Jr. meant by agreeable then was that everything, even the unintended detour, was within the boundaries of his knowledge. Knowledge which he would have collected from reading newspapers, travel narratives, old charts, and talking to sailors and captains. Knowledge alone, however, was not enough to ensure a safe voyage. The voyage's biggest challenge was rounding the Cape of Good Hope. By reading accounts, Elias Jr. was already aware of the great currents that prevailed near the Cape. Later on, American navigators and sailors would heavily rely on published guides like the Oriental Navigator that drew from manuscripts and journals written by the East India Company officers. Here, the writer noted the disparity between old charts and first-handed accounts around the Cape of Good Hope, concluding with a rather simple suggestion, follow your gut. And that's what exactly Elias Jr. did. He decided to trust his own observation of the moon and stars. The vessel successfully arrived at the Isle of France without any human or material loss. Elias Jr. cheerfully wrote, I was convinced that there could not have been an error of one leap in the observation. His confidence, however, coexisted with a sense of anxiety that the results could have turned differently. Elias Jr. wrote that the dirty blowing weather was threatening and at one point he wasn't able to see anything clearly ahead. That made him somewhat mortified, he wrote. And this would be the experience of subsequent voyages going around the Cape of Good Hope. The Atlantic Ocean that Europeans believed to have fully domesticated by the late 18th century would continue to be a source of some trouble and concern at certain seasons and corners of the ocean. As the Isle of France came into view, a pilot approached the ship. He ordered the ship to wait for the governor's permission to enter. According to Elias Jr., this process usually took two or three days. Fortunately, he was spared from the delay thanks to the weather. The change of the wind's direction suddenly disrupted everything at sea. We received the most severe assault that I had experienced the whole passage, he wrote. The pilot was equally alarmed by this disruption and immediately ordered the Grand Turk to enter the harbor. This incident was an introduction to a fundamental aspect of this part of the world. Here, human decisions were contingent on the whims of nature. 
In his letters, Elias Jr. discusses many things, including the season, profit margin, the number of American ships, to even his own weight. He asked his father to send him new clothes because of the old ones wouldn't fit him anymore. As I mentioned earlier, Elias Jr. was mainly concern concerned of three things, human network, interconnection between markets, and the supply and demand of goods. For the rest of today's talk, I'll focus on how Elias Jr. discusses each theme and how, how spatial relationships manifested through human interactions, trading patterns, and the movement of goods. The practice of trade at the Isle of France was both familiar and unfamiliar. After he loaded his cargo, Elias Jr. was approached by a group of merchants, most of them French. Eventually, two merchants each submitted an offer, but they were lower than what Elias Jr. expected. So he declined. Then he quickly learned that local merchants preferred buying cargoes in smaller bulks and immediately adopted that practice, although that was more convenient for him. Finding a credible business partner posed to be the biggest challenge. There's very little confidence to be placed in any person here, he wrote. Many were great rogue, he added. The only way to avoid doing business with them was to have one's own agent in place. It's absolutely necessary that there should be some person here in whom you can have confidence, he wrote. Dispatched to assume this very role, Elias Jr. verified its necessity by experiencing its absence. Some places would require extended periods of time to cultivate a credible human network, like, for instance, Bombay. Elias Jr. arrived at Bombay in September 1788. His voyage was delayed for months at the island because of, it, because of a lawsuit he was involved in and a failed rendezvous with Captain Elkins, whose ship drowned near the coast of South America. Elias Jr. bluntly reported the status of the market upon his arrival. It gives me great pain to acquaint you with the badness of this market, more particularly as you are a considerable loser, he wrote. What contributed to this misfortune was an unusual number of English vessels, three times more than the usual number, which caused a huge price drop of almost all English goods to 50 and 60%. Things could have been slightly better if Elias Jr. had a credible business partner to count on. The broker he worked with were descendants of Persians and according to Elias Jr., great thieves. He complained about their high commission and their bad reputation for fulfilling contracts. Rogue and thief. Both represent the disadvantaged position Elias Jr. found himself in. This vulnerability posed great difficulty because trade in these places had been conducted by and through trusted networks for centuries. And in places like Bombay, local intermediaries like the Persian broker had significant leverage over foreign traders and strong ties to the East India Company. If the Persian broker acted like a thief, it was partly because of Elias Jr.'s uncertain status. Elias Jr. had to prove his worthiness as a reliable business partner to meet a, reli a reliable counterpart. Shortly after, American merchants would recognize the importance and necessity of doing business with Indian merchants and invest in cultivating a durable relationship. For the Indian merchants, however, profitability rather than necessity would have been the primary reason for trading with Americans. When Elias Jr. faced eastward from the Isle of France, he had several options. He made three voyages to India from the Isle of France, to Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. In his initial voyage in 1788, he planned to sail for Madras because it seemed like a natural choice. The articles he brought from Salem, Madeira wine, rum, gin, beer, porter tar, candles, and some chocolate, were very well assured of a tolerable reception, he wrote. In addition, Madras would make a good stop for a voyage to Canton. Black wood from Madras fetched a handsome profit there. 
Things, however, did not work out as planned. By the time Elias Jr. was ready to sail, the season was too advanced. Instead, he decided to proceed the coast of Malabar. This was a risky decision. It was already April when he prepared to execute plan B, and it was well known that April to June was the worst season of the year to leave this place for Surat. And the whole coast of Malabar was very dangerous in the month of June and July, he wrote. In addition, pirates were sailing up and down the coast, preying on ships loaded with goods and cash. Regardless of these dangers, the coast of Malabar was an attractive market, for it was famous for high quality cotton, and this cotton sold well in China. Subsequently, vessels from Salem would sail to the coast of Malabar for articles acceptable to the Chinese. But in August, Elias Jr. was still at the Isle of France, waiting for Captain Elkins. Four months are entirely lost, he complained. And so was the season. Eventually, he had no other choice than to go to Bombay. A good ship may go to Bombay at any time of the year without the least fear, he wrote. Elias Jr.'s letters from Bombay are the most insightful as he makes suggestions for future voyages based on the information he collected on the ground. He's particularly attentive to the markets of Bombay, Batavia, and Canton. Bombay and Batavia shared a lot of characteristics as a market. Cash was the best way to conduct trade. Flour, copper, and iron that sailor merchants could readily supply sold well at both places. In addition, both places offered pepper. Their shared traits made it unnecessary to sail for both places unless one wanted cotton from Bombay and coffee from Batavia. If a ship was to sail directly from the Isle of France to Batavia, it should leave the island about the 1st of April, riding the height of the monsoon, wrote Elias Jr. If she has nothing but cash, as to have no detention at Batavia, she may be back at the Isle of Friends on the 10th of July, he added. Technically then, a voyage from Salem to the Isle of France and Batavia, and then back to Salem, a voyage across half of the world, could be completed in less than a year. Canton and Batavia shared an appetite for American ginseng, but Canton had no demand for American flour, wrote Elias Jr. Elias Jr. also found connections between Canton and Bombay in terms of ship tonnage. Elias Jr. advised sending vessels that were over a thousand ton to Bombay so that they could carry cotton to China. They may be employed in bringing cattle from Madagascar, which is perhaps the best business in the world, he wrote. In fact, this was a misjudgment. Large ships soon proved, proved to be unfitting for this purpose for they overstocked the limited domestic market. Elias Jr. fulfilled his role as an agent by providing multiple ways to think about the interconnection between different marketplaces through the medium of exchange, articles in demand, and a ship's cargo carrying capacity. The most invaluable price of information, piece of information, sorry, in a business correspondence was of course information regarding goods the very subject of trade. Due to limited time, I wanna focus on only one article that doesn't deserve enough attention from scholars, but was emphasized in Elias Jr.'s letters, which is the ship. Ships are almost the only article from America that will do well here, he wrote from Kolkata. Ships were not simply used to transport goods but were one of the most invaluable commodities that could change the whole course of the voyage. Also, it was a good way to obtain cash. Elias Jr. sold the Grand Turk for $1,300 and bought, and bought the Brig Sultana for $8,000. In making this decision, he planned to sail to Canton and sell the Brig there and return to the Austria, and return on the Austria, another derby ship, which he thought would be of great advantage. This plan failed, but, the event, but he eventually purchased another ship, the Peggy, in preparing for his voyage to the coast of Malabar. 
American vessels were in demand across the Indian subcontinent, but not in Canton. Shipbuilding in this place is superior to all others, he wrote. It was no coincidence that American traders were frequent places that demanded articles that they could deliver. Ships were one of the few. I wanna wrap up my talk here and return to a theme that I introduced in the beginning as important to my work, but didn't fully explain. And that's perceptions of space. Merchants rarely write about space in the way that we usually think about it in, a, in an objectively geographic sense. To them, space was more of a condition than a subject of knowledge in its own right. Merchants were more attentive to spatial relationships related to experience rather than spatial knowledge in a scientific sense. What I've tried to communicate today is that these spatial relationships are indicated in Elias Jr.'s descriptions of human networks, the interconnection of markets, and the supply and demands of good, demand of goods. In other words, Elias Jr. Constructed, constructed his perception of the East Indies based on his relationship with the people he encountered, the ports he visited, and the markets he considered, and the goods that transported across them. And it is in this context, the Isle of France becomes an important site for trade. Elias Jr. tends to display more confidence at the Isle of France than in Bombay, partly because many of the economic, political, and legal institutions at the Isle of France were extensions of the transatlantic system in which Elias Jr. was a respected participant. On the other hand, in Bombay, Elias Jr.'s status was more insecure, partly because it operated under its own system that was intertwined with, but also distinctive from the transatlantic world. Understanding early American commerce in the East Indies from the Isle of France invites us to rethink the East Indies as a set of discrete places where American traders constantly made and remade interconnections over long periods of time. Elias Jr. had only just started this process when he landed at the Isle of France in 1788 and faced eastward. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions while everyone has a few seconds, to give everyone a few seconds to type in their questions. Um, one burning question that um, Dan and I had was, you mentioned that Elias Jr. asked for new clothes. Mm -hmm. Was it clear that he had lost or gained weight? He gained weight. Ah. Yes, yes. So life, yeah. life wasn't as bad as I might've imagined on the show. <laughs> Yeah, and, and he also, I think, uh, asks to send um, his grandmother's cheese, like he was really homesick uh, in terms of food. So that's another story that's left out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it, it also shows, I think, an aspect of how to read business um, correspondences at the end of the day, depending on what you want to find. And a lot of scholars have pointed out that you can actually read a lot about the writer, right, the author, uh, himself or herself uh, from what he or she writes. Um, Excellent. Um, when you arrived at the Phillips Library, did your mm -hmm. research sort of take a, any sort of unexpected turns, um, any surprises, anything truly interesting that you want to share with us? Yeah, um, so as you might know, um, the proposal that I wrote really was just, just like about the Pacific Ocean. I want to get a sense of what these merchants uh, thought about the Pacific Ocean. Did they ever go there? And I mean, they did. They did eventually go there. But the time period that I was interested in, 1780s to the 1820s, was kind of too early for especially for Salem merchants to enter that um, trade uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade, um, which is going around Cape Horn um, and then um, touching the Pacific Northwest Coast to collect uh, sea otter um, furs and then going to Canton, that whole making that Trans-Pacific voyage. That was first really pioneered by Boston merchants. 
Um, so you kind of see like this division within Massachusetts merchant, merchants to what to kind of invest in. And the Derby family um, remains mostly in the East Indies trade. And that was the thing. Um, so I had kind of two options. Do I want to reconsider my time period? Do I want to think about, you know, after the 1830s, where it's very obvious that the trans, everyone is thinking about uh, the Trans-Pacific trade because it turns out to be quite profitable, profitable. But then um, I kind of rethought about the premise of my own work because if I, because what I've eventually found is that the archive was telling me something different that in this time period, actually more people were still going to the East Indies, regardless of the opening of the Trans-Pacific trade. So I decided, what does that mean? Or is there any relationship to be found knowing that these people would also eventually kind of like think about the Pacific Ocean, also invest in the Pacific Ocean? And then it, I think eventually that also led me to rethink the kind of whole larger question of, of my project, which is eventually the question of like, where is the Pacific Ocean, right? Like, where does it end? Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, we nowadays think about, of course, China as part of the Pacific Ocean, the South China Sea, um, and, um, you know, the Indi Indonesian archipelago and all those places. But in the time period that I study, most of the people still consider that as the Eastern end of the East Indies or the Far East. So I just kind of felt like, something's going on here <laughs> and um, I will better have to figure it out if I were to really write about this capacious kind of um, dissertation that really tackles the question of what did early Americans, Euro-Americans mostly uh, for my project, think about um, the Pacific Ocean? Mm -hmm. Is that the question really is that I'm not going to define the Pacific Ocean, but I'm going to actually follow uh, how they define this space that we now call as the Pacific Ocean. Um, did things change after and how after um, the Revolutionary War and Americans gained independence from England? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, things are just upside down now because, because before there weren't a lot of American traders trading in the East Indies because they were mostly, you know, uh, the East India Company is uh, monopolizing that space. But also they, for this few people who had that chance, where they were protected from the British Empire militarily, financially. So it was pretty, quote unquote, safe um, work or space, um, um, safe space for American traders. But now it's, they're pretty much on their own and they're entering space where there is little or no American presence of any kind. There's no American ports, uh, no American you know, East India company to protect if any legal or dispute happens. So that really kind of, that, that I, I would say it's both an opportunity and a challenge, but as a lot of historians have written about is that actually after, um, during the, Na the, the, the Napoleonic Wars, where there's a European kind of conflict within that space, that really is the moment when um, American traders find the opportunity to actually tap into that conflict and kind of work around that space as, as neutral ships. So that's when it really takes off, I would say. But the Derby families, are um, one of the kind of first pioneers, as I said, to really recognize that this is the space that we would have to invest in the future. And they turned out to be correct. Um, you mentioned that uh, Elias's father was referred to as King Derby. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the, the business uh, is up and down in the shipping trade, maritime trade coming in and out of Salem. Um, eventually, how successful were the derbies? Was, did, was Elias able to meet the, um, the measure of his father, or, or did he hand off the company to his successors in a worse state? Uh, or do you not know? <laughs> I don't really know because, honestly, I'll be honest here, I, I don't study uh, the derby family, right. per se. But for one thing, is that Elias 
Haskett Derby, father of Elias Jr., um, there is a reason why his, he is named King uh, Derby. And he's also considered one of the first millionaires uh, in, in America. And I think, I think I will have to double check, but I think um, Richard Peabody, or there's a book that uh, the, one of the Peabody family members wrote uh, about the Derby family. And in there, I found that Elias Haskett Derby during his around 20 years of managing the business, he eventually only lost one ship, which is extraordinary considering the number of ships that he sent to the West Indies, East Indies, everywhere where you can make money. So it's very clear that it's not just pure luck and that kind of fortune amassed, but it's also clear that I think uh, in my, one of the PowerPoint um, uh, I showed next to Elias Haskett Derby's portrait, there's this kind of Derby mansion there. And that Derby mansion is demolished in 1815 in part because they just can't afford that anymore. And Elias, Haskett, uh, Elias Jr. makes that decision. So if we were to read anything from that, I think it's not like downhill from there, but uh, for the Derby family, kind of the peak is actually during his father's time period. Early, early, great. Um, we have a, uh... Uh, some gratitude being expressed for your excellent talk and um, curiosity about if your sources reveal the degree to which the arrival of Americans into the space with long-standing trade networks displaced or disrupted those networks over, wait, sorry. <laughs> um, curious if your sources reveal the degree to which the arrival of Americans into the space with long-standing trade networks displaced or disrupted those networks over time? Oh, so in terms of how American traders kind of disrupted the old um, uh, trading networks? Um, of course, you know, there are quote unquote intruders in, into this old space and their success in part shows that they played a role in kind of reconstructing the um, established system. But I wouldn't go too far as you know, uh, that American traders played a huge role in, in kind of reconstruct this, reconstructing the system. More, more or less, it's more they're trying to find their place in this old system, how they're going to be accepted, uh, who should they talk to. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we have to consider is that the kind of system in part opens up itself because uh, the old monopolies of the European East India companies, uh, they are, you know, they shut down during in, in this period, especially the French East India Company. And that's really also an opportunity for American traders to you know, tap into those places that used to be uh, dominated by one um, or claimed to be dominated by these um, East India Company institutions. So it's like both, like the kind of time period is provides an opportunity and some American traders are very successful in taking advantage of it. But as I try to emphasize in my talk, that doesn't solely come from their own I don't know, genius kind of thinking or management. It always has to come through negotiating their place uh, with the, in, the indigenous merchants on the ground. And that is gonna cause some problem for some people. And that's also gonna kind of be an opportunity for some who are, for instance, able to negotiate the kind of racial and cultural differences that some American traders still find it very difficult to swallow. So yeah, it really depends, um, but I would say both. Um, did you come across any uh, insurance documents for Elias's voyages? Oh yes, there are a lot of insurance documents, um, uh, but for like this talk, it was kind of this packet of uh, letters, but yes, uh, insurance documents are are all over the place. And, but uh, for insurance, I'm finding that book and it's not here, but uh, the, the, the underwriters of Americans or something, there's a uh, Hannah Fraber's um, book is recently out. Uh, she is the historian of early American um, insurance, political economy. So if you're really interested in insurance, I would actually direct you to read that book. That's, that's an amazing book. And I can attest to the fact that we have tons of insurance documents and policies within our collection 
regarding the shipping trade and that multiple possible multiple policies were taken out on most ships and voyages um, in, in case of loss and that the the testaments that had to be uh, turned in to claim uh, losses were were quite intense mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so yes um, we have someone who would love to know how uh, Elias's mail got back to Salem from his ship. Mm, that's that's a great question, and that's something that Elias Jr. also talks about. Uh, and uh, most of the time, it's when they meet with other ships on their way back. Uh, they send those ships, and they're like always duplicates, right? They send just in case that ship drowns or uh, gets captured, so they kind of write two or three copies and just send it to other like ship captains. So some of them go to Europe and from there cross the Atlantic and arrive at Salem. And then other times, increasingly because they see more American vessels uh, in this region, they try to send it to um, American captains um, so that they would you know, end up in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and from there find their way to Salem. Um, and that's another thing in terms of, to think about in terms of network is that American traders in that space, it's less about, are you a Bostonian or are you from Salem? It's like, we are Americans. And that's less about like a political identity. I mean, of course that is important, but also where does that Americanness comes from is also the kind of communication networks that they um, develop and rely on. Yes. Um, and you spoke about Elias, I think it was, he was planning to sell the Sultan or the Sultana mm -hmm. in, um, in Canton and mm -hmm. and take another ship home. Yes. If yes. he had just been trading with the, the Sultan, he would have been in port in Canton for a while. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the other ship would have been working its way home and he would have sent mail home on it. Right. Um, were there um, a lot of other countries that used the Isle of France as a stopover on trips to Asia? Um, that is a good question. My understanding is no, not a whole lot. For one, for, for, for one reason is, for instance, there is no reason for English vessels to actually stop at the Isle of France, A, because most of the time England, the British and the French are at war, so they can't stop, they'd be captured. And another reason is uh, they have their own uh, stopover places. Uh, and at the most, for most uh, ships making that sail around the Cape of Good Hope, the Cape of Good Hope is, is the primary stopover place. And uh, the Isle of, one of the reasons that American traders do kind of um, consider the Isle of France as their uh, important stopover places is because of course the French allow them to do that. But also the Isle of France is a market of its own. All the kind of East Indies goods go pass through them. So for instance, in Elias Jr.'s letters, he also writes that, you know, if you can't get coffee from Batavia, you can just, you just can get coffee from the Isle of France. Of course, this coffee is different. It's not Batavia coffee. It's from Java or, you know, the Isle of Bourbon. But still, you can get, you can pretty much get the stuff of the so-called East Indies goods from the Isle of France without necessarily going all the way to Bombay or Kolkata or Batavia, if that just circumstances don't allow, like the season is lost. So I think there is, there, especially for American traders, there was a huge advantage uh, to be uh, being able to trade at the Isle of France, but for other countries um, that who already had posts uh, all over uh, the East Indies and around the Indian Ocean world, um, it, yeah, it's, it's less appealing, I would say. Thank you. Um... Do we know what languages Elias Jr. might have sp spoken other than English? So that is a great question. No, I, I do not know. Um, at least in this letter, it is not shown that or, or any kind of willingness to learn another language. But what I can say uh, from reading other letters, especially voyages that are made across or around um, Cape Horn and the Trans-Pacific trade, Many sailors and captains do write that they have some kind of proficiency with Spanish, which is of course understandable, right? Because those stopover coastal areas and islands were previously or still um, 
settlements of Spain or claimed by Spain. So language is really important tool of its own to actually claim spaces or to kind of make a spatial uh, relationship uh, to that's very foreign. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to find anything regarding uh, Elias Jr.'s own language skills. Fair enough. <laughs> um, you mentioned that, that a couple of um, trade ports preferred cash. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is a hard currency back in this time, like yes. gold and silver? Mm -hmm. And Spanish dollars. And yeah. Spanish dollars. Yes. Okay. yes. And that's another reason why a lot of the ship voyages, uh, they're not always directly from Salem to the East Indies. They have to stop somewhere in Europe to actually get cash because cash is, uh, Spanish dollar is kind of low uh, in, in America and the United States, especially after independence when, you know, the whole economic system is kind of still very unstable. So that's another reason why actually the ship is a very attractive commodity of its own because you can just immediately get cash. So rather than, and also, you know, if you have to transport cash all the way across the sea, um, you're also going to be easily preyed uh, by um, privateers or, you know, pirates. So yes, cash is um, Spanish dollars. Excellent. Thank you. Um, someone would love to know if the ships carried ice to trade with Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. Oh, that's a very interesting question. I know that you know ice is also a, a you know um, a commodity that a lot of merchants did invest in for some time, but no. First of all, no, I haven't seen any uh, kind of um, letters mentioning ice as something that might be um, sold. But I also think I've read from somewhere else, but so, so don't uh, quote me on this, but um, that yes, the kind of like ice that um, is found in, in the markets of the Indian subcontinent, they do come from America is my understanding. So like we shouldn't assume that, oh, it takes like months. So how can ice, you know, collect it from, I don't know, Salem uh, arrive in Kolkata? It actually, they, they actually do, uh, but I didn't find, uh, any of that uh, in, in Elias Jr.'s letters. Yeah, I have vague memories of doing a reference question on ice. Uh, and I, I feel like early ice trade did come out mm -hmm. of Salem, um, mm -hmm. the port of Salem and did go to India. But again, I feel like it might be a little bit later, certainly mm -hmm. early 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, don't quote me either. <laughs> I think we have one last question and, um, and that's about the, the, the one of the triggers for the 1812 war was that the British were blocking American ships from trading with France. Um, did you find cases of the Derbies then trading their East Indies goods with France or how did that work? So I don't know if I got the question um, correctly, but I think if, if, it's the, if it's a general question about the war of 1812, and its impact on the Derby um, business in the East Indies, of course, it has a um, huge impact. Uh, it just disrupts global trade in general. And you know, who to trade with eventually is, uh, as I try to um, emphasize in this talk, is not about you know, the participants, but also it's about where to go. They, they are closely linked because the people are kind of intertwined with the places. Uh, and that also is not only a commercial decision, but also a political decision. So the War of 1812 has, um, of course, a meaningful um, impact on American commerce in, in the East Indies in general. So the Derbies are not um, spared from that. Uh, but I will have to say, I have collected a lot of materials um, during my fellowship, and I am not yet uh, in uh, in the 1800s. I'm still stuck in, in the late 18th century. Um, so I'm still going through that, but I'm pretty sure uh, it's gonna be very easy to find, you know, complaints about, okay, the war has just disrupted everything, just save me. So, yes. Excellent. I know you, you were limited by our, our current um, 
closure or opening of only three days a week. So I know you took a lot of pictures to take home yes. with you and study <laughs> later. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to wrap it up. I uh, encourage anyone with uh, additional questions to reach out to the library at research.org and we can get those questions to Hisu. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions about our collection can also be directed there. And I think Dan is going to um, pop in for a, a second to send us all home. Thank you. And thanks, Hisu. That was great. And um, it's been a delight to have you as a fellow. And um, you know, please keep us informed about um, about your activities. It'd be really fun to, to follow up with you and, and um, track your career. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of all of this. So thank you. And thanks to Jen for managing the uh, questions and discussion. And to all of you who joined us tonight, we really appreciate your time. There will be a recording of this so you can watch it over and over and over again. Um, and thanks again to the Malamy family. And I really appreciate uh, your time this evening. So take care and see you next time.